So hi guys, welcome along to today's video. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I hope you're doing really, really well, having a brilliant day here on planet Earth. Uh, today's video, we are gonna be having a look at go-kart setup and what we can do to help try and improve your lap times around the track. Uh, we're gonna kind of break it down into three bits. There's gonna be a bit of the theory about how a cart goes around a corner, the setup changes you can make and what sort of effects it has, where you might run them, and then a quick practical setup as if we were going to a track for the first time. So that's what we've got in store for today. Let's go. So here we are guys. This is the pro cart that we've just put back together recently. It's all ready to go on track. We just need to complete the setup before we take it out. So first of all, we're going to talk about the principles behind a cart and how it goes around the corner. So unlike a conventional race machine, bikes, cars, etc., there is no suspension or differential on this cart. So the way that this actually achieves going around the corner is to have the chassis itself flex. And that's where these different cart manufacturers differ in the way that they maybe braze or TIG their chassis together and the materials they use will will change the amount of chassis flex and therefore change the handling. So if you were going around, let's imagine we were going around a left-hand corner. If you imagine the arc that this wheel would have to travel around would be a shorter distance than the arc the outside wheel would have to travel around, it means they need to rotate at different speeds to one another. In a vehicle like a car, that's done with a differential. These don't have a differential, they're a solid axle. So when the cart chassis flexes, it's actually lifting the inside wheel off the floor slightly to allow it to rotate at a different speed. So that's what's known in casting as the jacking effect, and that is the principles behind how we get a go-kart to go around a corner with no differential. It's also worth mentioning that with no suspension on these carts, most of the suspension is in the tubes of the chassis and the sidewalls of the tyre. That's where you get the majority of all your suspension movement. So that's a short bit about the principles of how the cart goes around the corner. Now we're gonna talk about setting this up to actually go round. So we, I would always advise breaking your setup down into these stages. I would start with your wheelbase and ride height and the chassis stiffness by adding or removing roll bars and seat stays and things like that. The weight distribution of the cart, your track width, your Ackerman angle, your caster angle, your camber angle, and finally your tracking angle. There's some more advanced features which we'll just mention later on, including axle stiffness and hub lengths. But as a basic, I would always go through the setup of the car in those orders, mainly because one setup will then affect the next setup you move on to. So if you do it in those orders, you won't have to go back and recheck any of the previous settings you've put on. So I'm not gonna give you an actual setup that I would say use this all the time from this video. All I'm going to try and do is advise you on how these different changes might affect the cart's handling. So you're always looking for that balance between front and rear grip. You don't necessarily always want to put the maximum amount of grip into the cart. If you've got a cart that's pushing on as you're understeering into a corner, probably because you've got too much rear grip, you either need to increase the front grip or take a bit out of the rear. Vice versa, if you've got one that's a little bit too much front grip and as you're steering into a corner, the rear end's loose, you need to either take a bit out the front or put a bit into the back. So using all of these different setup techniques is what you need to go to the track and play around with on test days to find out what works best for you. So there are a couple of specialist tools that you might need to do this job with. Um, most importantly, as ever with any job like this, a nice cup of tea to enjoy along the way. You're going to need a selection of Allen keys, spanners, sockets, depending on what kind of adjustment, um, what brand of adjustment setup you've got for your caster and camber. You're going to need a steel rule. Ideally, you'd like to have something like this to lock the steering wheel in the position, unless you've got a very helpful friend or associate that just wants to stand there with you whilst you're adjusting this. And most importantly, a set of decent laser tracking gauges. So these are Sniper. Very, these are the version ones, they're quite old now, but they actually still work very, very effectively. So you need these to be able to accurately set your front end alignment up. Now, if you want to learn any more about how 
composition car suspension works or heave springs, roll centers, center of gravities, things like that, then I cannot advise enough these two books here. So they're fantastic books and they really delve into the detail of how you make a car go around a corner. So the Smith's book, as it states on the front cover, is more about the fundamentals of the complete motorsport engineering, covering data logging through to uh, suspension settings, clutch types, etc. Whereas the Haynes Competition Car Suspension book is far more in-depth about just competition car suspension, going really into detail. Now, at the end of the day, that's the most important part of any race vehicle, is actually getting it to go around the corner. So don't waste your money on these loud exhausts and air filters. Spend your money on suspension and brakes and you'll soon be beating all your mates around the lap. So any good motorsport team has got themselves a little black book. A little book of secret information which they've accumulated over years and years of practice days at various tracks, trialling different setups, different temperatures, different driving styles, different drivers, etc, etc. So this is, there's no one magic bullet when it comes to setup, it's just an accumulation of experience and going to the track and making you sure you record all of this information on your test days. So the weights, the ambient temps, the tyre temps, the cambers, the casters, the type of axles used, etc, etc, etc. And then it's nice to be consistent to go to one track with one driver and make one setup change at a time and see the impact it makes on the handling. Once you've got this sort of information, you can then start to build a picture of how you can set your car up for a race day. So the first thing we're going to look at, folks, is the wheelbase. So the wheelbase is the distance between the centre line of the rear axle and the centre line of the front stub axle. On this on the front, the wheelbase isn't adjustable forwards and backwards, so that's in a fixed position. However, on the rear, you can see from these holes with the chassis, we've got four positions that we could actually fit these axle carriers, axle bearing carriers into. So we've fitted this in the top hole, which means the chassis is low. The axle's high, the chassis's low, and it's on the long wheelbase setting, so it's the furthest away. So we'd use this as a standard setup. If you was on a particularly tight and twisty track, you might move it forward just to give you that little bit shorter wheelbase, but to be honest, we've always just sort of fitted it in this position and left it in that longer wheelbase, low rear end position. So that's how you adjust the rear wheelbase and ride height. Now we said the wheelbase wasn't adjustable at the front, but the ride height is. So on these stub axles in here, we can see we've got a base washer, a spacing washer, your stub axle, spacing washer, another base washer. So if we, we've got these equally spaced, so at the minute we're a central ride height, if we put both of these washers at the top, we would lower the stub axle, raise the front end of the cart, so we'd have a high ride height, and vice versa, if we put both these spacing washers at the bottom, then we would raise the stub axle and lower the front of the cart. So with regards to the height of the chassis, you would normally run it low if you've got a very, very smooth, fast flowing track, um, and, and raise it up if it was more of a bumpy, very, very high kerbs, just to get your ground clearance on the actual kerbs itself from the chassis. You might also want to raise the front up if it's a tight, twisty track and you need to get a little bit more weight transfer onto that front axle to get it to turn quicker into the corners. So now if we look at roll bars and how they affect the cart's handling itself, basically when you're adding roll bars to the vehicle, you're, you're um, stiffening the chassis, you're making it harder to turn. So this, if you've got a metal rear bumper on them, this is actually a roll bar because if it's bolted up tight, it's connecting both sides of the chassis together. So you can run these tight or loose. You can add these additional bars underneath the side pods. So they actually bolt between them there to stiffen up the bars. And again, you can run these pods tight or loose. And you can even add additional seat stays, adjustable seat stays like this to again stiffen or loosen the chassis off. Now at the front of most carts you'll also have this torsion bar installed. These come in various different thicknesses and materials to change the stiffness. You can also get flat bars which you can rotate in position to adjust the stiffness just with one bar rather than having to swap them out. So obviously with the bar installed it's a stiffer chassis, it ties the two halves together. Same with the pods. 
same with the seat bars and the same with the rear bumper. If it's all tight, it's making the chassis stiffer and harder for it to twist. So you might run a stiffer setup, uh, especially in the wet, because you're not creating the forces to actually get that jacking effect to get the cart around the corner, um, or potentially in very, very sticky conditions where you're generating so much lateral load around the corners, it's putting the carts actually twisting too much, so you need to stiffen it up. This is also achieved with different uh, stiffnesses of seat, all the way from very, very soft seats up to a very stiff hard seat. Again, it ties the two halves of the chassis together and the floor tray. So this is a Kevlar floor tray on there. If it was an aluminium or a plastic floor tray, it would change the stiffness and the rigidity of the chassis. So again, another option of something that you can play with there. Now, when we're looking at track width, what we're talking about is we're talking about the width from the face of the hub all the way across to the face of the other hub. So on the rear, this tends to be measured from the bearing hanger out to the face of the hub, making sure that your adjustments are equal both sides as we're not racing around the Indy 500. If you then got a tape measure and measured from the face of this hub to the face of that hub over there, it would give you your total track width. On the front end, that's achieved by the use of spacers. So you can see here at the minute, this is set up with the hub quite far out on the stub axle, lots of spaces on the inside. So this would be a wide setup. If you remove these spaces, slid the hub along, put spaces on the, ins on the outside, that would be a narrow front track width. Uh, when it comes to settings for these, as a general rule of thumb, if it's wet, low grip conditions, you'll start to move the hub outwards and try and get a wide front track to give you that stability to create your jacking effect. Um, and on the rear, you would be going in as narrow as you can, as you're not generating the force, so you need to try and get it to tilt to relieve the inside wheel on the rear axle. Uh, in the dry, somewhere, you don't want to go too wide with the rear, but you'll be coming wider than you would in the wet. And on the front, generally in the dry, you'd be slightly narrower, down towards a sort of 10 or 15 mil mark. The tighter and twistier the track, the narrower you tend to run the inside, and the faster and more flowing, the wider you tend to go. Again, equal both sides, as we're still not racing around the Indy 500. So moving on to weight distribution, um, there's a few little bits and pieces you can do on the cart to play around with the weight distribution. How you're gonna get this reading is by sitting the cart on the floor on level ground on four bar from scales on each corner with all the gear on, you sat in the cart and somebody taking the measurements. You can then, I'll show you in a little while how you can then work out the percentage distribution front to rear, but you'll be looking on a pro car like this somewhere between 54, 55% rear, 45% front. Um, if you want to try and get some of that further forward to get more front end on the cart and get more weight over the front end, the main way you can do it is by the positioning of the driver's seat. So you can drill new holes in the seat, tilt the seat upwards, move the driver further forward is gonna put more weight over the front end. There are a few other minor adjustments that you could make, um, especially on a pro cart with twin engines because you've got the weight both sides. You could even, you could adjust the engines on the engine mounts itself to move the position of the engine in or out. And you could also move the position of the engine forwards or backwards by running longer and shorter chains to try and get some of that weight over the rear axle or a bit further forward, depending on what you're looking for. Generally, the further rearwards you have the weight distribution, the more rear grip you're gonna have, and further forward, the more front grip you're gonna have. Um, weight distribution is quite different from corner weighting. Um, corner weighting is something you would do at the end of the setup when everything else has been done on the cart and you're happy with all the settings, then you would corner weight it, uh, but it's quite difficult to corner weight a car as the driver moving around in the seat can shift the balance a lot. Whereas in a race car, once you've got your suspension set and it's corner weighted, it doesn't tend to move from that too much. Obviously another good way to move the weight around the car if you need to is where you're adding your ballast. So if you're bolting your ballast, if, you, if you've got a nice lightweight driver and you need to add a few kilos of ballast, if you're adding it here on the center of the chassis and it's too rearward biased, then you can actually move it right up the front, try and get the weight over the front end. 
So always better to have a lighter driver and have to add ballast than someone that's too heavy to begin with. It just gives you more setup possibilities. So let's have a quick discussion about Ackerman angle. So Ackerman angle is what allows the front tires to turn at a different radius. So again, let's imagine here, we're going around a left-hand bend. So the left-hand tire not only has to travel at a different speed, it actually has to travel at a different radius. So this is effectively done with the use of the Ackerman angle. So if we see here as we turn the steering wheel to the left, the left-hand stub continues to turn once the right-hand stub has finished turning. So it actually turns on a tighter radius. You can see that there. So that is what the Ackerman principle is. That is achieved by having different pickup points on the steering column. So here we can see We've got two separate pickup points, one for the left, one for the right. If they were both bolted in the centre together, both the outside and the inside wheel would turn at the same rate. So what that causes would then be the tyre, instead of going around and gripping around the corner, to actually be scrubbing across the surface. Um, which depending on the slip angle of the race tyre you're using, you might want a little bit of scrub to generate the maximum grip. But generally you need to use Ackerman angle on these carts to actually get it to corner effectively. So the adjustments on these are on the column itself where you can see we've got a lower and an upper hull. So the further away from the column you move it, the quicker the steering will feel in your hands and the more responsive and the closer to the column the opposite, the slower and lazier the steering will feel. And you've also got adjustment on these stub axles. So you can see here we've got an inner hull and an outer hull. Again, on the outer hull, you're going to have less response from it, slower steering effect. On the inner hole, you're going to have a quicker steering effect. So this is the, the end on the stub axle is far more um, poignant than on the column. You'll notice it a lot more if you change it on the stub axle than you will on the column. Uh, it's really, if you're using a tight twisty track, you want some quick Ackermans, so you've got quick steering. Whereas if you're using a fast flowing track and you don't want to upset the rear turn into corners, you can slow the Ackerman down a little bit and put it onto a slower setting. Another thing to take into consideration with the Ackerman is if you are changing the position on the stub axles here, you may need to change the length of your track rod ends to keep the same toe settings that you want to achieve. So next up we've got caster angle, which relates to the front end of the cart. So the caster angle is the angle at which the kingpin would intersect a vertical line through the chassis. So if we imagine that this bolt here is our kingpin that runs through the stub axle and you've got a vertical line straight down through the centre of it, you can see the bolt is not fitted through there centrally like that. It is actually at an angle like this. So that is the basic caster setting that's already built into the chassis of the cart. So the angle is the line between this bolt and a vertical line that you would draw straight down through the stub axle. That's your caster angle. Now, if you look on the top here on these adjustments, these are nice because you can adjust your caster and your camber separately. On some with the, um, the rings you have to move with the circlips, when you adjust one, it kind of tweaks the other one. So these are really nice setup, being able to adjust them individually. And as you move this further back, you're increasing the caster. And as you move it further forward, you're reducing the caster. So you'd use a high caster setup in low grip conditions. So a wet track or a green track. And you would use less caster in high grip conditions. Uh, say if you're running new tires, qualifying on new tires, or as the track tends to grip up through the weekend. Again, you'd use more caster for the tighter, twistier tracks, less caster for the faster flowing circuits. This will also, if you increase the caster by bringing it back and having positive caster, you'll get a lot heavier steering feel on the wheel. So if it's an endurance race and you're doing a 24 hour race, you really don't want to be putting full caster on there because after an hour or two hours, your forearms will feel like Popeye. Now let's have a talk about camber angle. So your camber angle is if we were looking at the tyre from the rear or the front and it was bolted onto this hub face here, your camber angle is whether it be pointing in at the top or out at the top. So negative camber would be in at the top, positive camber would be out at the top. So these carts do have a bit of built-in camber into the chassis so that when you actually bolt them on and sit in the cart, 
it will level the tyre up a little bit with the surface of the track. So the idea of your camber angle is that when your cart's going around a corner and it's loaded up, that tyre contact patch will actually be the maximum surface available. If you didn't have the camber angle and you set it up so it was perfectly fitted, the contact patch was perfectly on the track when it was stationary, once you started putting the load through the tyre, the contact patch would actually get smaller. So we need to have the camber angle there for that. Uh, we tend to run uh, a positive camber setup, so out at the top more often than not. Uh, we tend to use that when the tyres are a bit more worn and we've got slippery conditions. Uh, and you'd use negative camber more when the, the track's super grippy or you've got new tyres on, something like that. And last but not least is your tracking, which is your toe in, toe out. So that would be if we were looking at the tyre from the top and this was the wheel and tyre, toe out would be the front of the tyres pointing outwards and toe in would be the front of the tyres pointing inwards. Now I've never used toe in on a go-kart to be honest, it's always been parallel or toe out. So your toe out at the front end will give you a better turn in a quicker response when you want to turn it into the corner. So if you're battling under steer, you'd be inclined to put more toe out on. Not only does it help with uh, turning, it also can help the tyre warm up. Because it's towing out and you're actually scrubbing that tyre across the surface at an angle, you're generating heat in that tyre. So if it's cool conditions, a bit more toe out will help to warm the tyre up faster. But if you've got a track with long straights, um, the actual scrubbing effect of the tyre down the, down the straight can slow the cart. So in that circumstance, I'd be inclined to run it more parallel and use some of the options, other options we've got available to us to create that positive front end turning in effect. So that's the principles behind a bit of cart setup covered. Now we're going to set this up and do a practical setup as if we were going to Wilton. Shit. I think the missus is coming. Oh God. one. She thinks I'm out getting DIY materials. If she uh, she thinks I might be playing around with go-karts, that could be the end of me. Right, oh, we'll have to keep her head down then. So, as we were saying, we've done the theory about it. We're going to put a practical setup on this cart now, as if we were travelling to Wilton Mill for the first time. So Wilton Mill uh, track has got a mixture of quite fast flowing corners, and slower technical sections. So we're going to just put an average setup on this cart. Uh, we're going to say that the ambient temperature is around 20 degrees and it's the Friday dry session and it's the Friday before the weekend when the track's still pretty green. So let's go ahead and see how we're going to set this thing up. So the first job is to set up our wheelbase ride height and roll bars. So it's a dry track, it's a Friday test day uh, the track's pretty green, so we're going to go for a, a long wheelbase, low rear end. We are keeping the front ride height level with the spacing shims equal either side. So that is the wheelbase and the ride height setup. Uh, chassis stiffness, we are fitting the front torsion bar, that's going to be in. The pod bars themselves are reasonably loose as it's a dry day, no seat stays. Standard seat and floor tray, and at the minute the rear bumper is tight, so we're going to loosen that rear bumper off. You can now see the rear bumper is loose allowing the rear end of the cart to flex around a bit. It's important that when you loosen this that your locking nuts have still got some of the bolt thread coming through so that they don't actually work off and let the bumper completely fall off if you're going to run it loose like this. So that's the ride height wheelbase 
and chassis stiffness sorted. So we've had the scales out and we've weighed the cart. Let's just run through what we've found with you folks. So as previously mentioned before, make sure you've got all your carting gear on. You've got the cart set with the fuel level that you're going to be running. You're doing it on a level surface and your cart meets the minimum weight required for whatever class you're racing in. This is weight distribution checking, not corner weighting. So don't worry about this bit here for a minute. So we've weighed the cart in this condition and we've got a total of 190 kilos. Now on each corner, we've got 43 kilos right front, 44 kilos front left, 51 kilos left rear, and 52 kilos right rear. So in a total, these all add up to 190 kilos. So if we add the front axle together, we get a total of 87 kilos. And if we add the rear axle together, we have got a total of 103 kilos. So we can see obviously there's more weight over the rear, but now if we want to work that out as a percentage, we have to do the number, the total number in the rear, 103, divided by the total mass of the cart, 190 times 100. And that will give you a percentage on this particular setup here of 54.2% weight really biased. Exactly the same on the front, a smaller number divided by the larger number, total mass of the cart, times 100 to get your percentage. And on the front, we're obviously looking at 45.8. These two combined add up to 100% because we can't have more than 100%. So I'm pretty happy with this as a weight distribution, 54.2 rear, 45.8 front. This is now where if you was actually going to start adjusting this, you might take the corner weighting into consideration. So the difference with corner weighting to just moving the ballast around the cart to change this number is that with corner weighting across the diagonals from the right rear to the left front and the left rear to the right front, you want to be getting the same number. So at the minute, left rear to right front, we'll work out at 96 kilos, left rear to right front, is actually 94 kilos. So if we was moving this ballast around to change the weight distribution, we'd want to be trying to do that so that we've got 95 across both diagonals here. When you're doing corner weighting like that, it's important you slacken the roll bars so that you're not putting any twist into the chassis and you do it as your final setup once all your tow camber tracking, etc., has all been done already. As mentioned before, this can be a little bit overkill on carts because it's difficult to keep that corner weight in position with the driver moving around so much within the car. Now let's adjust the rear track width. So to start with, let's measure what we've got set up there. We are currently at 152, 152 millimeters from the bearing carrier out to the hub face. So on this, we can adjust it pretty much from 150 all the way out to 160. So we're gonna set it in the middle at 155, which is simply means just slacken these Allen key bolts off. Put our ruler nice and square. And we can knock that hub out until it reads 155. Lift the bolts up. And repeat the same process the other side. It's important to remember if you're making five mil of adjustment on this end, it's actually a 10 mil total overall difference in, in track width. One final check. You can see there we're sat at 155. Now on the front, we are going to go for a 15 mil spacer. So these spacers come in a variety of 5, 10. If 
5, 10 or 15 mil. So we're going to go 15 mil, so just a one spacer on there. We're not going to put the hubs on just yet because we've still got to do the caster, camber and tracking on the front end, but we will do the same both sides so we don't forget. So again, another 15 mil spacer. Again, the same as at the rear. If you're taking five mil off this side, you've got to take five mil off the other side, so you're actually affecting the total track width by 10 mil. So for the track conditions we're facing, we're pretty happy with the Ackerman setup on here. We've got the inner tie rods in the lower hole, so more Ackerman, quicker steering. And on the outside, we've got them in the outside hole, so slightly slower. So it's a mixture between the two. In general, Ackerman isn't something you tend to play around with too much. Once it's set, you keep it, you just get used to the driving feel of it. It's maybe something you'd use for the smaller drivers or younger drivers to maybe try and lighten the steering or give them slightly more responsiveness if they can't get the angle into the wheel. So we're happy with this for what we're going to be running on track conditions. Let's move on to the caster. So we're going to go for one rib of positive caster on this. As we said, the track's green, it's a Friday test day. At the minute we're set up central, so this top plate here has got one rib at the front and one rib at the back. Hopefully you guys can see that. So to put positive caster on, we're going to move it back one rib. So we need to slacken the kingpin, which is just the Allen key bolt at the top, nut at the bottom. Once you've slackened that, you can then potentially adjust the plate. On this type, we also need to loosen the camber adjustment to allow the plate to move freely over the ribs. So now we should be able to lift it up and just get one extra rib of caster on there. So now you can see we've got two at the front and none at the back. So we've added a little bit of positive caster. Now we need to nip it up, but be careful it doesn't do that and move and accidentally put more or less caster on than what you're aiming for. So once you've got it in the position you want it, it's a good idea to put your Allen key in and hold it downwards whilst you tighten the nut up, just to stop it from moving. Now we've nipped it up, but we don't want to do it fully tight because we still need to adjust our camber. So you make sure you can still turn the bolt within the housing, but not enough to lift the caster plate up. Again, we're going to repeat this process on the other side. So we're going for two ribs at the front, one at the back. Now you can see the bolt hasn't got any up and down movement in, but you can still quite easily adjust the camber across the top. So these are your sniper laser alignments here. They've got a magnetic base on the bottom to stick onto your stub axle. You've got a spirit level on the top to level up your laser alignment on the stub axle. You've got the on off bit on the back, which you screw in to turn it on, which makes a contact with the battery and turns the laser on. And if you undo it, you disconnect that connection. It's important you undo it, try and undo it a full turn, just so that you don't accidentally turn the battery on when it's stored and end up wasting the battery. Now on the front here, you can see we've got a forward arrow, which should be means that this should be pointing towards the front of the cart. And we've got this central point here where the laser comes out of. Down the bottom, we've got the toe scale, which toe in is to the left, toe out is to the right. And on the side, we've got the camber gauge, which positive camber is towards the top, negative camber is towards the bottom. So if this is our central point here, anything below the Allen key would be negative camber, anything above would be positive camber. And if that's our central point for the toe, anything to the front would be toe out, anything to the rear would be toe in. So these boxes, I believe these boxes are two millimeters of adjustment with the dot in the middle being one millimeter. But to be honest, it doesn't really matter too much the actual numbers. It's important just to remember the setting and the feel that you get from that setting. You've also got to remember that if this is two mil toe out here, if you're doing it on both sides, you've actually got a total toe out of four mil. So it's important to remember that when you're writing down all your settings. So let's get the gauges on and start offsetting the camber. So now we've got our laser alignment on there. 
We've slid it up to the 15mm spacer we've decided to use. We've leveled spirit bubble on the top and turn the laser on. Always checking that alignment with the level on the top, very important. Same on the other side, we turn the laser on, level it up, and now as we turn the steering wheel you can see the laser appear on that gauge. So what we want to do is we want to turn the steering wheel so that both sides are equal. So we can see on the left hand side we've got right in the centre where the laser is coming out of. So we've got no camber and zero toe and that is identical on the right hand side. So now we know we've got the steering wheel in the equal position, we can go ahead and lock the steering wheel off. So on this particular steering column boss we do actually have a threaded hole here which we can insert a bolt to lock the steering column. However most carts don't have this on and you can damage the column itself there if you screw it in too tight which is where this steering lock comes in handy to hold the steering wheel. If you haven't got this the steering will keep moving as you're attempting to adjust the tracking. So unless you've got somebody willing to stand there and hold the steering wheel straight like this for you these are a really really handy piece of kit. So let's pop that on If you do happen to move the steering as you're installing that, you can just go ahead and nudge the steering round as well at the same time to get it back to where it was. So now we can see we've got our steering wheel locked off with our steering lock. We've got our lasers on both sides. Our lasers are leveled up nicely with the spirit bubble. And you can see on that side, the laser is bang in the middle. And on this side, the laser is also bang in the middle. So you can see we're in a nice neutral position to start with. Now what we're going to go for on this is we're going to go up to one box of positive camber and we're going to go out one box of toe out. Again the track's quite green as the track grips up we'll expect to bring this back down towards the neutral line. So let's adjust the camber. So I've removed the NASA panel to try and get some more access in there. We've double checked our lasers are level on the top, we've turned them on, we've checked and we want to adjust this camber angle. So first of all, we need to make sure the lock nuts are loose either side, like so. Don't forget when we're adjusting this side, it's actually affecting the camber on the opposite side of the cart. So if we watch that laser over this side, As we're adding positive camber to it, you can see the laser level moving up until we get the one box of positive camber that we are looking for. So that adjustment over here on the top was just winding this, take it back out, that back across. You can see as we wind this in, going to add the positive camber. So we get it to where we want it to be. This might change slightly as we lock the king pins off, so keep an eye on that. Always double checking all of your spirit level bubbles and your wheel alignment on the steering wheel to make sure it's all still tight. And we're happy that we've got the right amount of camber that side. So now we swap over and we do exactly the same on the opposite side. I'm just going to add one box of positive camber. There we see. So now all we need to do is just wind this up to the other side of the cast of the camber pill just to stop it from moving. Make sure that one's nice and tight where we've just adjusted it. And then we can just lock these locking nuts off whilst holding the grub screws so nothing moves. We don't need to go too tight with this, it's just to nip it up, stop it working loose. 
Once we've adjusted the camber and we've tightened up the locking nuts to set it in there, now we can nip up the kingpin to its fully tight position. As we won't be needing to adjust any of that top plate any further. There we go, again both sides. Now ensure your lasers are nice and level. Your steering wheel is still straight where you need it to be. And double check your camber angle now that everything has been nipped up. So now we've got the caster and the camber set. Now we need to finish off by doing the tracking. So for this we need to adjust the track rods and the track rod ends. It's important to remember that one of these is left-handed thread. This has got the normal nut on, so it's a standard thread, lefty, loosey, righty, tighty. This nut on the inside has got the little marks on it which means this is actually a left-handed thread, so it undoes in a clockwise direction. Now, I like to fit the left-handed thread both on the inside, so I know when I'm adjusting the inside, they're both left-handed thread. Outside is both standard thread. So the first thing to do is hold your track rod and just crack off the locking nuts either end. So we can see as we turn this track rod in and out, what we're doing is moving our tracking point across the gauge. Again, the right hand track rod adjustment will show on the left hand sniper gauge. So we want this set to, we said one box of toe out. So we're looking to go forward to the corner of one box right there. So we can see that is now one box of toe out. When you get it there, just lightly Nip the locking nuts up with your fingers. And we move around to the other side. So at the minute, we're not quite there where we want to be. So we just adjust it until we get to one box of toe out there. And again, just gently nipping the nuts up with your fingers. So now we've got the tracking and the camber in the position we want it in. What we need to try and do now is lock off these track rods without moving anything. So important when you do this, to put both of your rose joints facing one way, either down or up, one way or the other, so that as you tighten it up, you've still got free play in the rose joints once it's fully tight. You'll see what we mean as we nip these up. Now they're both nipped up, we can see we've still got plenty of play in the rose joint. So the rose joint itself isn't binding up on the surface of the stub axle or the steering column. If we tightened it up and one was that way and the other one was that way, we then wouldn't get that free play. So always ensure you've got that free play once they're nipped up. Now we just need to nip up the other side. So we said when we started this, we wanted one box of positive camber and one box of toe out on the front. So here we can see now we've finished on that side. We've got one box of positive camber, one box of toe out. And if we move over to the left hand side, the same again, one box of positive camber and one box of toe out. So we're ready now, hopefully, to hit the track. We've made sure the track rods are nice and loose still. We've got free play in there. All the kingpins, camera adjustments locked off. The final thing to do is just to fit the hubs on with the correct spacers that we've selected. So here's our 15mm spacer on. Next goes on the hub. Spacers on the outside. Important if you've got small little 5mm spacers like this, try and put them on first like this, with the larger spacers on the outside, as the last spacer will slightly overhang the stub axle like this. Now if you're using a small 5mm one, it could potentially be sitting not very square and fall off. So smaller ones on first, then your larger ones. You can see there how that last one overhangs the stub axle. If I was using a thinner spacer, it could fall off. 
and it will go on. Then your retaining washer and your stub axle nut. Now when we do these up, if you haven't got an internal spacer between these bearings, if you do this up fully, you're going to completely stop the hub from turning very nicely. So you can see that the hub doesn't turn very well and the actual spacers are tight. You can't turn the spacers on the stub axle. So you want to do it up and then nip it back off slightly so you can move the spacers on the, on the stub axle nice and freely like that. You can see the spacer moves independently of the hub, but no side to side lateral movement in that hub. That means your hub will spin nice and freely with no resistance and you won't wear the bearings out prematurely. Repeat that process for the other side, pop the wheels on and we're ready to go and hit the track. So there we have it folks, the setup's complete. Uh, as we said, this is a, a bit of a green track and as the weekend progresses, the cart setup's going to change as the track is probably going to grip up more and more unless it rains as the rubber goes down. Uh, this is a good general base setting for this cart to start on a track such as Wilton Mill. So we just need to go out there now, feel the feedback it's given us and then make some adjustments one at a time and see what effects that has on the handling of the cart. So thanks for joining us. If you're new to karting or looking to get into karting, Go and have a wander around your local paddock, have a chat to people, they're more than friendly. Uh, it's a very involved sport. A lot of people think it's maybe something for children or something that's quite simple, but hopefully as you've seen from this video, you can, you can go really as in-depth as you wanna go. A couple of extra points here on advanced setups are actually the axle length itself, the material and the stiffness of the axle can affect the handling of the cart. Again, you're just affecting that stiffness of the chassis. And with your hub lengths, if you also use a longer hub, that will affect the stiffness of the axle as a complete package. So rather than changing the track width, you might want to keep the same width, but just change the length of the hub to almost act as stiffening up the end of the chassis. You can also do the same on the front by changing the hub length. Obviously, when you change the hub length, you're going to need to add or remove a certain number of spaces here. And that will give you a similar feeling of stiffening up the front end, but potentially being able to use longer hubs and remove the roll bar. It might give you a different stiffness feeling than if it was shorter hubs with the bar installed. So a couple more advanced settings there for folks who want to give that a try. But thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it, guys. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Look after yourselves. Ta-ta.